Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much educators for joining me in January. It's, uh, I know that all of you are either sort of still on a, a little bit of a hiatus or perhaps you're, you're halfway in between working and, uh, and trying to take some time off and to keep the old well-being levels up so that you are so that you've got it, so you can get through the long year ahead, or perhaps you're already completely back at work. Um, but uh, I want to thank you for putting a little bit of your time aside for something that I guess is a topic that has emerged for me that um, that I think that anecdotally I always knew it would uh, as a as a topic that we'd need to do is about what we can do about stress in our schools and uh, how we can avoid the some of the negative impacts of stress in our schools as we move forward. I, I made it a bit more of an explicit focus, I guess, in Term 4 uh, when I wandered around schools and I just, I just paid attention, I guess, as I went from school to school and meeting to meeting and the, the, the training that I was running and the support that I was running in schools. And what I looked for, I guess, was what was the answer that I was getting from people when I asked, so how are you doing? And if you sort of, oh, yeah, there's, there's, the, there's the great Australian, how you doing, which is sort of no big deal. And uh, you, you're, you're supposed to answer, you know, with things like, yeah, fine, fit. Um, but then there's the one that when you really eyeball someone, and when you really look them in the eye and say, so how you doing? And what I really noticed was that I was getting an increasing number of not only teachers, but of, um, of school leaders also who were looking me at me in the eye and they said, I was sort of going out to my car and writing down some of the things that they were saying. And the three themes that emerged was that they were saying they were stressed out, um, they were saying they were tired, and they were saying that they were busy. And um, what we know when, and I think those tired and busy things is probably something that contributes um, beneath that stress label. And what we know about what happens to people when they get stressed is that the first thing that's impacted is their performance. And if you think a little bit about, you know, even um, outside of the school's sector and you just think about people in their lives, as soon as they start to experience uh, depression, anxiety, uh, that overwhelming feeling of stress, the first things that go are their ability to just perform really simple day-to-day -day tasks. And the unique nature of teaching means that we're constantly asking people in schools, it's us and it's uh, as school leaders and, and it's uh, us as teachers in the classroom, we're constantly asking them to perform a complex, a continuous and a, uh, a, a and sometimes incredibly repetitive series of small tasks to a really high level all the way through a school year. And it really did make me start to wonder, you know, gee, what is the, what, what's the impact on you know, not only um, not only the simplest of things by which we're measured in student learning, but what's the impact in the, in, a, in very human terms when we don't get very active and very clear about what stress is in our schools, what the impact of it is, and what levels of stress are kind of healthy, which is a bit of a strange thing for me to say, but it leads me into my next slide, which I felt very uncomfortable designing this slide. It's um, it's about the fact first of all that I've got you here on false pre pretense um, in that the, the truth is that when I advertise for a webinar that says the stress-free school is that it doesn't exist and um, and it shouldn't exist uh, yeah the the research here by a fellow called Peter Nixon is one that I think stands the test of time he actually first put this little graph together and this is the reason why this is the worst slide I've ever presented. This is a, a graph obviously clearly designed on a computer in 1979 um, because it's not very pretty to look at. But I actually think it's the one that for me makes the most sense. It's, it's um, Nixon's stress response curve. And what he says is that when we talk about arousal stress, we talk about levels of stress, and there's a good level of stress. And there's also when we cross a line, which, which Nixon calls the fatigue line, where it becomes a negative level of stress, it becomes distress. And um, the bad stuff happens on the wrong side of that line, but without some level of stress, without some level of pressure, without some uh, sense of urgency in our people, the performance will also parallel and it will stay really low. So what we're talking about today is operating, I guess, in, you know, in that tiny little very crudely added to this graph um, yellow uh, triangle there, which is what what Nixon would re refer to as eustress, which is where kind of the good stuff happens, where we're still on the good side of the stress level, um, but there's a we're, and we're operating in that sort of flipping in and out of what we would call our comfort zone. 
So Nixon refers to the comfort zone as in, the, in there is when we've got a high level of arousal stress where there's an urgency, there's an importance around our job. And I actually, I say to people all the time, while we might have a teaching workforce that is saying things like we're feeling uh, exhausted and we're feeling stressed, we're feeling tired and we're feeling busy, it's important work and all important work is taxing. And so we want to have a level of tension in which people feel comfortable still doing a really good job. But we want to flip flop where we get we get a little bit outside of that comfort zone occasionally. And all of us would probably articulate that, you know, quite casually sometimes that we like to, you know, get outside our comfort zone. And what Nixon's pointing out is that when you get people out of that comfort zone, you get that little further along the stress line, but before you cross that fatigue line, if we can get some really great stress management uh, techniques and if we've got strong stress management awareness in place in that space we can work there and people will do fantastic things without them tipping over. And unfortunately as you can see from Nixon's graph that when we do tip past that fatigue line, when we constantly add layers of work and when we don't do anything that um, that remedies or that starts to address the symptoms by which people find themselves coming to a diagnosis of high levels of stress. When we don't do that, their performance starts to drop very quickly and they start to they start to drift down rapidly through exhaustion, ill health and into breakdown. And I know that you know, myself as a school leader, I've worked with people who have got themselves down past exhaustion into starting to feel sick and losing time off work and then into complete breakdown. Down. And what we know about stress and what we know about mental health in the workforce, particularly for our adults, is that it doesn't take much. We don't need to go far past that line into distress for them to get down there. And as they start to slide down, it's very, very difficult to get them back. Um, so we want to make sure that we're operating where that yellow triangle is. And I think that it's really apt that, um, that school leaders and, and educators or aspiring leaders such as yourselves get the opportunity just for an hour, just for an hour, just to step into that yellow triangle and just see what we can see what we can do while we're working in that very difficult and very narrow imperative. So what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to try and go really quickly. I'm going to look at the three key things, as I said in the in the blurb for the webinar today. I'm going to look at the three things that that stand out in the research when you synthesise the research, but between teachers and school leaders. And funnily enough, there's not been a lot of research done that synthesises those two cohorts. There's been some stuff done on principals, and there's been some stuff done on teachers, but not a lot has been done to to look at what are we where's the overlap here and how can we work on that. So I'm going to fly quite quickly through the content part of my webinar today, but I do want to make sure that you're fully aware that there are some things in place today that, particularly towards the end of the webinar, that I'm going to provide you with. Uh, some of them in forms of the handouts that you'll be able to see that are already there uh, in the control panel um, that you can access at any time during the webinar. I'm going to refer to each of them during the webinar so that you know um, when's a good time to download them or to make a decision about whether you want to download them or not. But if you're a bit like me, you probably had the feeling of this fella in this picture today <laughs> of force feeding over Christmas, of taking in too much. Know that we're going to support you with that. The first download that you can actually see there in, in, the, in the handout section, if you see one that says RS Webinar Stress-Free School, uh, that's just the PDF of the slides from today. So if you want to have the slides from today, you're welcome to grab those, download them. Don't feel like, for instance, then that you need to take notes today. Uh, we really would rather you do something, you know, very January, I suppose, and that is to just engage, enjoy it, and I'd much rather you be a part of today than furiously take notes. We'll also do what we always do, which is to send you later on the um, a link within the next couple of days to the recording of today, so that you can watch it as many times as you need to to um, to get what you're looking for out of it. Okay, so what I mean by engage is that it's not the time to just sit there. You're not watching a movie. You're actually live if you're if you've joined the webinar today. And um, so I don't want you to get sort of too comfortable. I think that when we are talking about a topic like stress in our schools, that everybody has their own, you know, for instance, definitions of what stress is all about. For some of us, even that idea that there should be a healthy level of stress in our schools can be a confronting thing to think about. And if I say something that's confronting, I'm actually really happy about that today. <laughs> um, and I'd love you to try and say, well, actually, I'd like to, I'd like to jump in on that. So there's ways that you can do that. Um, the first is to put your hand up. So if you have a look, just like a regular classroom, if you do just have a look at the, um, the control panel, you'll see where there's a hand and you can put your hand up 
Now I'm going to make an assumption when you, if you use that, the hand button, and that is that you will have something to say, just like you would as a teacher in the classroom. Um, so if you do put your hand up, I'm going to unmute you and give you the chance to contribute anything that you wish to say. And like I said, I think that I've always contend that too much teacher professional learning is nice. It needs to be more provocative and it needs to pose more, uh, you know, it needs to set us up for a little bit more conflict and difficult conversations. And if you need to have that, I'm prepared to have that argument. Um, and if you're prepared to be wrong, then so am I. So um, very much feel free to use that. So I'm noticing now that Betty, you've got your hand up. So that could be a, a, one of those accidental ones, but um, and I'm noticing you've done a very marvellous job in putting it down, Betty. So if you do have something that you want to contribute or ask, please feel free to put your hand up. The other thing you can do is go to the question box and you can put your questions in there. If it's a direct question about what we're talking about, I'll, I'll stop occasionally during the webinar, I'll, I'll stop myself and have a bit of a gawk just to make sure that um, there's not a topic that you guys want to want to chew on today. Uh, also, if you're, if you're having any technical issues accessing the webinar today, feel free to put that question in there. My wonderful business manager, Chris, is online today and she's great at dealing with all those technical bits and pieces. Feel free to whack a question in there if you're having any trouble hearing or seeing or anything like that. She'll be able to point you in the right direction. And also, I guess if there's something that you'd like me to follow up later on with you, then feel free to put a, put a question in there and we'll make sure that gets going. But I want to really encourage you today to you know, use that control panel, get in, get actively involved. So we've got we've got an issue with teacher stress, and we're, when I say that we, we we have an issue, I guess we need to step back to what are the causes that have had that uh, issue start to show up for, show up on us. Um, you now I went on and did a um, a radio interview this week with Tom Elliott in Melbourne on 3AW about the the recent comments that were made by uh, by a Queensland. Um, member of Parliament on his Facebook page where he made a bit of a comment at the start near the start of January. So are all teachers back at school in inverted commas lesson planning? Uh, you know, oh, sorry, are they back at school or are they at home? Inverted commas lesson planning. Clearly, um, clearly mocking teachers to be honest and saying that you know clearly in, on the in in the outside of you know, nine till three thirty five days a week teachers really aren't doing a great deal. And um, and I posed to Tom that we have to ask ourselves a question. When we see data such as the 30 to 50 percent of teachers who are dropping out of our workforce within the first five years of their teaching career, do we have a problem which is just that we have teachers that are small, soft and complaining all the time? And that's why I really love this picture. Um, is that the teaching workforce? Did we, just, did we just happen to create a product that, you know, the, the idea, the, the, the notion, the, the vocation of teaching is something that seems to from find people who are pretty soft and lacking in resilience landing in there, or do we genuinely have a problem? Do we genuinely have a complex and difficult situation in our schools that we need to start taking the first steps towards navigating, and that we need to start to become, uh, you know, start to, I guess, step into a higher level of consciousness about what's causing us to get data like that one that we're talking about with dropout rates as people begin the, begin the career. Now, what I would like to put to you, and as I did in the blurb for the webinar, I guess for the people who are here today, it might have got, might have, uh, might have got your attention. What I want to put to you is that when you do synthesise the stress uh, data between teachers and school leaders, we find three key things stand out. Uh, number one is we talk about student behaviour, so I'm going to have a good look at that today. Uh, number two, and to be honest, it's number two, we, we sometimes rank things one, two, three, as though there's quite nice, easy progression between them. But number one, student behaviour ranks incredibly highly for, for teachers, and then there's a big gap before we come down to issues around workload and then below that there's uh, quite close behind workload is issues in terms of communicating and building relationships with parents. So um, so I want to say that today instead of being the, the birds that we looked at a minute ago, what I want to do is say that this is us at the middle of a maze and we, all we need to do is to start to get more far more strategic about how we're going to get ourselves out of this and how we're going to make sure that we're working in that eustress place that Nixon would talk to. What are the facts? What are we dealing with here? Um, teachers work hard. 
and there, there isn't any other way. And as much as people in the media don't want to talk about that, they want to talk about whether teachers are lesson planning at the start of January or whether they're still at work after 3.30. Here are the facts. Teaching is in the top 5% of professions who are likely to do work at home, who are likely to be working at 7 a.m. in the morning. At the top, and what we mean by that 7 a.m. measure is two hours before their official start. They're in the top 5% uh, percentage of struggling with that word today, but they're in the top 5 percentage of professions who are likely to be working on a day off, including a Sunday, and in the top 10% of professions who are likely to be supplementing their income by doing some other kind of job. So what we mean by that, I guess, is that you know we have teachers working uh, about 58 hours a week uh, while they're in term. Uh, it's about 59 for primary, about 55 for secondary apparently is the, is the breakdown there. And so what that means when we talk about teachers and where they rank in terms of hourly rate, the amount of hours they contribute for what they're paid, um, they rank incredibly lowly. In fact, in fact, in some jurisdictions down into the lowest 5% for hourly rate for what we would rank um, for positions that we would rank as being professions. Uh, Australian teachers are also far higher than the OECD average in terms of face-to-face -face time and they're lower than the OECD average in terms of their planning time that they receive. Now these are some things that we don't have a huge amount of control over but the truth is that it's manifesting in that problem we've got that while people are coming out of university saying we want to do teaching, we're passionate about the work, we actually like what teaching is all about, when they arrive they run into a great big brick wall and the brick walls manifest in terms of student behaviour, workload and issues with parents and 30 to 50 percent of our best and brightest go, you know what, I can do better on the hourly rate somewhere else. And that's something that as educators we should be, you know, we should be wanting to actively do something about. And so that's why I guess this webinar brings itself about today. So what I want to do, I guess, before I get too heavily into the into the content part of the webinar today, is I want to I watch a couple of polls. I want to first find out what's your opportunity for impact, which means I want to know, you know, where you where you come from here. I'm just going to launch this poll here to find out who we have in the room with us today. So if you would, just let us know over the next few seconds really quickly. Are you a, a print or a system leader? Are you in that AP role? And APs are really, I really wanted to give the APs their own role, their own position there because I really think that APs are often responsible for, say, the well-being or even the staff well-being bag. Uh, are you in that senior leader, uh, senior leading teacher role, aspiring leader? Or are you coming at it from a teacher, a tutor, an admin, or another position? Uh, and I'll sort of bundle them together just for the sake of not having a poll that didn't have too, too many responses. So thanks, guys. You've all jumped in really, really quickly there, which is just fabulous. Uh, I'm going to close that poll just so you can get an idea of who's in the room today and share as well. And we can see that we've got people who are in the big chair. That doesn't surprise me, actually. There's probably a lot of people here who are in the principal role who are, who are, who are joining the webinar today from their principal chair uh, and in their office at school. So that's fair enough. So what I'm going to do today is try and shape the webinar just a little bit to make sure that we're... Um, to, you know, just a, a little bit to make sure that we're talking about teacher stress today from that leadership point of view, um, which is really very much how I had the, the webinar in mind. If you're here today in a teaching role, uh, that doesn't mean that you can't deploy some of the strategies we're talking about here, and you certainly have a, a really strong role in getting out there into your school and starting conversations around what's, you know, what can be done to improve the teacher stress scenario that we find ourselves in at the moment. Uh, I just want to move on once more also and just find out what it is that you're, you're really looking for today. What's your, what's your focus today? So I'm just going to launch one more poll and just find out from you. It's a, it's a little bit, I guess, facetious in me doing this one, a little bit cheeky perhaps because I've covered off on those three key areas today. But what, do you, what is it that you think is stressing teachers the most? What are you experiencing in your school? Do you think it is about, are you looking for strategies today that are around improving student behaviour? Are you looking for some stuff that can be done quickly and easily to do something about workload and the conversations that certainly appear in, work, in, in schools around workload? And then the third one is around building it and communicating with parents. And then those last two, are, the first three are kind of what objectives and the last two, I guess, are more how objectives. Uh, it's about leading meaningful change. How do I actually get some traction with the things that we're looking to do today? And then the last one would be, I had to carefully identify the best place to start. So give me just another moment there. I've got a responsive crowd today because I usually look to try and get over 80% or one minute. And you guys have already got me over 80%, so that's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to close that poll and share those results with you.
and said, well, well, we have a bit more of a smattering here. That workload one really presents strongly. Uh, and also about, I guess, that how do, you, how do you lead some change in, in that whole... And I think one of the things that when we talk about stress, we're trying to lead a change in narrative. It comes through in the, in the way that people speak uh, ar around that. Uh, can, can we change that default that we have around uh, around people saying that they're going to, you know, um, that, that, that they're feeling stressed or they're feeling tired or they're feeling overwhelmed or they're feeling exhausted? Okay, I think we can, um, I'm going to hide those results and move back into the webinar. I think we can really get into some key things that you can that you can do as you move forward. So that's student behaviour. I'm going to tackle those three topics today. And what I've done is to try and construct a webinar today that's, that's built around the idea of um, five objectives that you might like to keep in mind, that you might like to take these objectives back to your executive or to your... Uh, to your PLC or your leadership team and to just have, or, or even to your staff, and to just have conversations that say, are we doing the things here that have been proven to have the biggest bang for the buck in terms of getting somewhere in the areas that are stressing us the most because those areas that are stressing the most are reducing performance most significantly. So the first one I want to bring up to you is having consistency of a genuine whole school approach. Now, when I say that, a lot of people tend to leap to in their heads the, the idea of, okay, can I tick this box? Can I say that we have a program or that we have a way of doing things or that we have, you know, for instance, bucket fillers or we might have you can do it or we might have bounce back or we might have, you know, a, a, a reward system or we use our houses and, and that kind of thing. I would suggest to you that they are whole school programs and they're not whole school approaches. The re way that you can tell a difference is that it, the, between a program and an approach is that a program is something that you need to allocate time to. So it means that we might be running a, um, a program on Wednesday afternoons across the whole school where we're explicitly teaching. There's nothing wrong with explicitly teaching social skills. It just can't be that that's where it ends. Uh, an approach is something that leans on and impacts language. And that means, does it change the way that people talk? So those in the round, I look, I look across the, the list of attendees today and I can see people like Julie Gleeson and Jan Rollinson and Bernadette Hayes and what I know about those people who are already Real Schools partners is they'll be fully aware of my intentions around restorative practices. Why do I advocate so strongly for restorative practices because it changes language. Uh, the very first thing that we do in restorative practices is learn how to use effective statements, which means instead of saying, you know, hey, don't do that, we'll say, hey, it upsets me to see you do that, you need to fix it. So it's a tiny investment, but it's a very clear thing, there's a clear, clear difference in the way that we tackle low-level behaviours. If you're like most people, you would have picked up on the word upsets when I, when I made that statement. And um, that's what makes it affective, not effective, affective in that it taps into the, uh, the limbic system of our brain, um, affects the way that we slowly but surely start to notice the way that our behaviour affects other people and that's when we get empathic young people. So what I'm asking you is how have we built consistency of the way that we talk to each other in our school by having a genuine whole school approach geared around improving student behaviour and um, reducing, reducing uh, problematic and disruptive student behaviour and also building empathy in our young people as well. Uh, number two, the, the, the thing that I think is hugely important, and I think this is the, the number one around student behaviour, it's number two obviously on my chart, but number one for January, I think is to have a conversation around what are we going to be proactively do around the top three to five percent, the kids that we would colloquially refer to as being pointy end. Um, unfortunately, what we what it manifests often as the, the challenge in schools is that once we've got the end of the year, that student then goes from somebody's class into another class and they become that other person's problem. That other person doesn't want to admit they've got a problem because they feel a little bit of a sense of shame around it, so they hang in there and they do the best they can for a while and sometimes it's not until the end of first term or even first semester that they go, you know what, this ain't working. Too long, too long. So what I think really clever schools that are tackling student behaviour proactively are doing is that they've made some choices around the way that they're going to support behaviour improvement in those 3 to 5% of kids before they get there. Which means that most of our teachers could probably tell you 30 minutes into the first lesson on the first day who the kids are that are going to need a behavioural intervention. Um, I want to help you with that. So in the handout section, you'll see that there's two docs. One's a Word doc, one's a PDF um, that are called IBP, IBP Blank and IBP Instructional. Our partner and member schools access a... Um, 
uh, a webinar we did previously around individual behaviour planning and and these are two documents that can support that and um, that you can use to help kids improve their behaviour and actually get some success. The fundamental to it is that when we work with these three to five percent of kids, we tend to we tend to try and fix everything that they're doing wrong. And the truth is, they're doing a lot wrong. Uh, none of us change behaviours in clumps. So any of us that were silly enough to stand up on New Year's Eve and make eight resolutions have probably failed at all eight by now. Um, so what we need to do is to get more specific around one behaviour, get measurable improvement and help that young person uh, by rewarding them through their strengths and interests to embed that behaviour and habit. We can then make that replicable and move, move across throughout the year and improve several behaviours across the year so that we're not necessarily handing another problem to the teacher or to the year level in which to, into which that student's going the next year around. So a good think about are we proactive, are we ready, genuinely, for the pointy end students as they arrive in 2017. Um, the next one is to make sure around student behaviour that our feedback that we provide for teachers is around practice. Uh, far too much feedback, I think, is around the things that it's the easiest to give feedback on, which is about the, the appearances, it's about the, the operational, it's about program, uh, it's about whether they're meeting compliances. But teachers are screaming for feedback around practice. And how are we, what, how is it that as a, start, as a leadership team, in, in, as an example, that we could actually step into a space where we are proactively uh, out there, out and about, and able to um, able to provide meaningful and useful feedback to our teachers. Uh, I know that myself as a principal, I had a little mantra you know, in my head that was every class, every day. And look, some of you work in big schools and that's not always possible, but my every class, every day was just a really quick walkthrough and sometimes it would be just long enough to throw a high five to someone and keep moving, but, and sometimes I stayed for a bit longer. But what it meant was that when I sat down to provide feedback for my teachers, I could step out of feedback over what's in the folder and I could step into feedback about what's happening between the walls of the classroom. And my teachers would receive that feedback because they felt their practice had been deprivatised to a level that I knew it well. So making sure that the feedback that we provide our teachers is very much around practice and conduct, uh, how we're building relationships, how we're leveraging those relationships is critical to getting, um, to getting improvement in student behaviour. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm going to be a little braver about this. I've talked a, a fair bit in the past around the, how, the, how, the, how 30 years ago in our schools we didn't have our values defined. And I've asked often to people, does that mean that the schools 30 years ago didn't value anything? And of course they did. Uh, but it, it seems to me that one, one of the things that we, uh, we should be pushing back against is mindlessly walking down the process of defining values that are purely aspirational. Which means that we come up with five words that seem to be the, the, the values that we want and that would be really nice if we had that. We make signs out of them, we make banners out of them, we put them on letterheads and then very little behaviourally changes in the school. So what we need to do is to say if we do have values and they are aspirational and they're good values, I haven't found a school yet that has the, you know, the value of laziness and they're looking to have behaviours that back that up. But what we need to do is to get out of making banners and headlines and, and agreeing on values and saying, rightio, if these are the values we've got, how do they manifest behaviourally? I, um, I talked to a, a video I saw once of uh, a year 10 middle school um, and it was in the United States who had a distinct problem with student behaviour and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of disruptive behaviours and a lot of kids who were doing some really dangerous things. And what they did was, that, uh, when, as a new principal arrived, he said there needed to be some behaviour that backed up the school's stated ambition of and value of respect. Because at the moment we had respect up on the wall but no one was behaving respectfully. So what he did was he engaged the students to design a new logo for the school and they had the logo which was the students own work and they had some ownership over it. They had it carved into the lino outside every classroom. And the kids were asking, why is it there? It's in the way. And the principal and the, the students agreed that what you do, if you actually do respect, if you do respect your school, what you do is you never step on the logo. So they had a whole cohort of students who were stepping into the classroom and stepping over the logo very deliberately. What it did was, it, now most of us would go, well, that's not exactly respect, just taking one big step. But what it did was it gave the teachers in the school something to thank and congratulate the students for doing. 
that made the value that the behaviour valuable to them, and it meant that they wanted to do more of that. And once they mastered it, they looked for the next thing that they could do that was respectful as well. And teachers were able to say, you know what, just like stepping over the logo, that's respect too, and I value that. Well done. So they worked backwards. Instead of saying, let's come up with a big banner and hope that people live up to it, they said, let's come up with a small behaviour that demonstrates something larger and let's build upon that upwards to the value. Uh, and the last thing that we want people to do is to um, start to get into a bit of classroom management planning. To be honest, I'm, I'm a little frustrated with the extent around programming and planning. This goes to the notion of workload in the next in the next little domain. Um, I'm a little frustrated about how much planning we do in our school for what we want to teach and how little we do for how we're going to teach it. So if we can get teachers actually starting to be explicit rather than implicit about the way they're going to behave in the classroom, about the way they're going to deal with conflict, about the way they're going to deal with student disruption, about the way they're going to you know, build uh, collaborative learning environments, about the way they're going to assist colleagues to interact with students and with each other. If we can get people to be more explicit about that by actually you know, writing it down and putting it in their program, then, um, then I think that we can give more, uh, more direct and we can give more focused feedback on how they could get better at it. It's a funny thing about writing something down too. Once you write it down, you're kind of accountable to it. And um, but when when it's implicit, it's uh, it's something that you can just sort of allow to to drift by, which can be a concern for us. I'm just taking my moment here, just to pause and just check that I don't have any hands up or any questions at the moment. I take it that you're all highly engaged as a result of that, uh, but please make sure, I just want to use this as a little reminder, jump in, jump in, pick a fight if you need to, January is a good time for it. Okay, workload. Um, five things that you can do around workload that I think really make a difference. Oh, number two seems to have missing, which is no good. Uh, number one, I'm just going to see if I click. Oh, they're just in the wrong order. That's all it was. Number one is to induct on how ahead of what. So what I mean by that is that what we want to do is to make sure that as it, what we do when we get new teachers into the school and. I'll, Often, you know, nearly all of you will be working with new colleagues as we as we commence the school year, and often what we do is we put in their hand a bunch of man, a bunch of you know, folders, or we point them towards a um, we point them towards multiple servers and and folders on computers that they need to read so that they can be a teacher at our school. And we catch ourselves saying things throughout the year, yeah, yeah, but I told them that, or yeah, yeah, but I gave him that, or yeah, yeah, but she needs to be able to do that to be a teacher at this school, and they're all true. Um, but the what parts, okay, the compliances, the things that, the, the things that have to be done, uh, when the bell goes, what the processes are for kids transitioning from your classroom to another classroom with a PE or whether, the way they need to behave in the library, how long they can borrow, um, how long they can borrow books for, all those little things, how they need to access the canteen, all those little things can be found out along the way without much harm being done. But if they don't have a lot of, um, if they don't don't have a lot of um, uh, a lot of support with the way they're going to conduct themselves, or what, for instance, those whole school approaches are around behaviour, if they don't know how they're supposed to behave in the school, then they will continually make mistakes with that that do cost us because they cost us in terms of relationships. Um, so really important to I even know one school that's gone to the trouble of now taking its induction manual for new staff and saying, well, what we're going to do is divide it into two, and they have the how manual and the what manual, and they are, they always when they hand it over to new teachers, they say, we want you to read the how manual first and we want you to read the what manual when you have a moment. And, uh, and I think that's really a, a really clever way of going about it. So describe contact, conduct, describe what those values mean, describe what our behaviour management approaches, approaches are and our relationship and our wellbeing approaches are, give people a really strong understanding of how they are to behave and all those little operational things can happen um, at, a, at another time. Just before I talk to that, I'm just noticing Leslie picking up on here that um, some examples of classroom management explicit programs would be awesome. So Leslie, I'm going to put at the end of this um, webinar today, my contact details will come up on the screen in the last slide. Um, I'm, if you email me and Leslie, anybody else who's um, who, who had that question as well, I do have some samples of some classroom management um, templates that you can use and they, they go from the very basic one pager through to something fun more explicit and detailed. Uh, if you drop me an email on that address, I'm going to make sure that you get some of those examples of classroom management plan templates so that you can uh, move forward with those. The second one is visual and verbal priorities. And what we mean by that is 
One of the things that, that, um, that teachers uh, very uniquely do in the workplace is they say, yeah, but I've got to do this. And they say it about everything as though there's no priority. And what that is, is a message that we have not made the priorities clear. Now, we, so what the, the two ways in terms of visual and verbal is number one, when we're getting around the school and we're talking to people in our meetings and also informally, are we verbalising what our priorities are? What are the big things that really need to get done? And then also do we make those visual? Are we clear about what are the things that are more important than other things in the school? So a terrific principal who I knew had his, um, what he called his, his JFDIs up in the staff room and it was only 12 things and JFDI, let's just say the JDI stood for just do it and I'll let you work out what the F stood for. And they were things that the school, that, that he wanted his teachers to get done, he wanted to be very clear that it was a priority that they're done, but it's not something you needed to do, spend any more time on than necessary. Okay, so some teachers will pore over small administrative tasks and then say the administrative load's too high, when the truth is they, we just don't want them to spend that much time on it. We need to make it very clear what's core and what's peripheral business. Um, the next one here is multiple communicative channels. So make sure that you're not just communicating the same way with people. So you know, think about how you use your meetings really cleverly and with a lot of variety. I used to send out a week ahead email, which meant that just every it was my you know as my uh, with so many school leaders in the in the audience today, um, it's worth me probably pointing out that you know most of us are probably doing something on the weekend, and one my weekend task was to send out a quick email to whole staff with just the main things that are happening that week. That, might, that are worthy of their consideration as they work through the week. Um, if I was smart, I would have done what many teachers, are, and a few school leaders that, that I know now are doing, which is do it as video, um, because it's something that's much easier to, to watch multiple times or to just access the part you want to use. And even you know, even using the, the little things like text messaging to, to just remind people of, of small but important things as they come up, because the, the thing that causes stress for a lot of people is short, unexpected timelines. So if we communicate in multiple different ways, we can make sure that we, we mitigate risk around that. As I mentioned before, making compliance is clear, making it clear the things that, uh, that they need to spend little mental and energy and time on. Um, and I guess when I do that, I, I refer back a little to the old Bloom's taxonomy and about the which are the things that they should be using at the, the um, the knowledge and comprehension level and just getting it done quickly and not think too deeply about it but also what are the things that you really want them to be creative and to problem solve and to solve and to design new solutions around because that's a if we if we let people know that they're the things that we want them to, to, to spend more time and effort on then uh, and, and we and we make that really clear for people then they tend to do it and this is a strange one, but it is something that is actually popping up in the literature here as something that's worth doing is to occasionally cheat, to occasionally around workload, let people know that there are things that you can let slide through to the keeper. That sometimes, I know one principal who I think does a remarkably clever thing, and he says that what he does is once a semester he cancels a meeting for absolutely no reason. It's there, nobody knows it's coming, it's not a particularly important meeting, it's one that they could get covered at a different time but he highlights when it's going to be and 20 minutes before the meeting he just cancels it. And um, what he says is that it lets people know that, that, that you know what, it wasn't that important but we never ever cheat on the things that are really important. But letting people know that occasionally something is worthy of a cheat, is worthy of stepping around, introduces the human element in your work and let, lets people know that you appreciate that they need a little break and prioritises them, a little like a, some overlap with a couple of these other points, prioritises them on about what's important and lets them know that if you're going to let something go, let it, let, it, let it be something that isn't particularly at the, at, as, uh, as something that we would describe as core business. And the last one's the parent trap, okay? What would we do around getting our parents engaged? So what are the things that schools do that actually, um, that, that have cohorts of parents that record the highest uh, you know, uh, parent perception data responses? And what are the schools do that, what are the schools doing that are, um, that are improving their parent perception? 
their parent perceptions. And the first thing they do, and this is what any corporate communications expert will tell you, is that they communicate, 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 and the little bracket that should go after that is even when they've got nothing to communicate. So what we don't do is put in, um, you know, fill a newsletter with something that's not particularly important. Go back to what your whole school priorities are and what you really want to be known about and write about that. Write about an opinion piece about, even if it is about a Queensland minister, uh, member for parliament who's written the wrong thing about teachers. You know, say something really strong that embeds your expertise as an educator and do it often, uh, do, do it repeatedly, you know, do, do it regularly and get that message out there and use all of the different, um, the, all of the different mediums that you have available to you. You know, get teachers you know, pumping out a, a quick little letter or pumping out a, 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 um, a little generic email to everyone in, the, in their homeroom every, every few weeks. You know, use your assemblies as well to communicate around those key messages. Um, don't just report. You know, as any English teacher will tell you, reporting is not the only thing that you can do with a keyboard or a pen. Um, don't just describe what happened and these students came back from camp and these students came back from, you know, went, went to inter-school sport. Uh, talk about what you're going to do also and what you're going to make a priority. Um, be where they are and communicate where they are is really important. Our last webinar was about how to set a Facebook, up, uh, a Facebook page up that really works for your school. Um, so I'd encourage you to get Get hold of the get hold of that one if Facebook's a priority because there's a, what happens in terms of social media and the different places that parents gather and the truth is that uh, particularly the, when they look at the research the the mums less the dads but the mums of um, of school aged children are amongst uh, are a cohort that into which social media has penetrated most deeply. So they're there, and if we're not there with them, we leave a vacuum that they will fill. If we're not talking about us, they will talk about us. So it's hugely important to get a social media presence up and ready for your school. It's not just social media though. It's about you know wandering out to the car park. Um, it's about it's about inter you know, heading over to groups of parents after assembly and asking for their opinion, inviting them in for a coffee. Be where they are so that you're aware of what they say, and uh, takes you out of needing to quite picture yourself as a fly on the wall quite so much. Uh, the next one I want you to do is to make it their idea. So that means to consult really heavily and to you know put your sales hat on. You know, start to be a salesman or woman as the case may be and get to your school council with a really well formed idea and proposal that they think, wow, this person's really thought this through. Get their endorsement before you make key, key changes uh, because then you get to regularly speak to the fact that after heavy cons consultation, um, you'll notice that you know one of the things that I love watching um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an astute watcher of people and, and media and I love when I see that a, 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 um, there's a big band has come out to, to Australia and they always have one show only but then there's the next ad that comes out that says in response to overwhelming demand and I think that's what you want to be able to do with things that you're looking to change in your school is to say in response to overwhelming demand from our parents we've done this in response to heavy consultation with, with parent groups Groups, we have done this. So letting them know that it was their idea is a, is a really important thing. Uh, I know that myself when I hear that, you know, for instance, I'm going in a, in, in a couple of weeks with my wife, we're showing our bogan side and we're going to Guns N' Roses at the MCG and when I hear that Guns N' Roses is close to sold out, I go, wow, everyone loves Guns N' Roses. We, we love Guns N' Roses. I buy into this being collectively about how we fill the stadium. The truth is we're two out of 100,000 people. Number four is to let them own their emotions. So when you do have parents who do complain, this is a responsive strategy and less a proactive strategy, is to just let them talk. Make sure that they get it off their chest, so to speak. So as anybody who knows the restorative stuff knows well that we all have shame responses to things going badly and most of the shame response will come out first before we say anything rational and it doesn't mean that everything they say when they're feeling really upset is what they want you to do. So let them own their emotions, let them be sad, let them be angry, let them get it off their chest and then ask questions such as questions like, so which is part of this is the one that you really want us to get to work on first? And then the last one is to make sure that you train them how to treat you. 
Um, so that means always model, don't never turn a parent uh, interaction into a tennis match. Uh, always make it very clear what the what one principal I know works with what he tells his parents. These are the rules of battle. These are these the, these this is what the um, the United Nations tells us we must must adhere to if we're going to get something done. Now let's battle. And by then the parents smiling anyway, and um, because it's such a ridiculous notion that they're going into war, and so some of the edge has been taken off it anyway. But one of the things that's really important is to let people know that we have a you know we might have a, a conflict resolution approach that we might have written down that this is how we do it, um, you know, and uh, this is how we conduct a meeting when something's gone wrong. Um, so that we don't have parents storming out of meetings going, well, I didn't know, you weren't going to listen to me. You let them know what those rules of engagement are um, and including how we're going to argue. Then you can really, then you can really get somewhere with, with parents. So I'm mindful that I have gone, as I said, like a bull at a gate here um, and filled you and you might have some things in your head that you want to ask now rather than just making this whole hour about what's in my head. So uh, I want to pause for this moment here and just find out if there are any questions, particularly around those three key domains. Even though, I guess those last two, um, when I did that poll before about you know about the, the, the how stuff, not just the what stuff, but how you can lead change in this space and, um, and how you can get some meaningful traction in this space. If you've got any questions, then feel, feel free to Pop them in now. I might have people feeling a little shy. Alright, look, I want I want you to take this moment also to, you know, if there is anything, just keep typing. Don't stop just because I change slides. I can certainly be flexible enough to revisit it. Um, like I said before, noticing that we have got some people in the room who are currently in partnership with real schools. This is our bag. This is what we do as we step in and be a critical friend to your school. Um, there's a download that you can grab out of the handout section, which is the one that you can see on the screen. It's one we've just put together because it really shows, I guess for us, one of the things we're really proud of is that we don't just show up at school and do a workshop and run away. In fact, we won't. We, we will never, we, you cannot book real schools to come out and do a workshop. But what you can do is have someone, you know, myself and uh, there's also a couple of other people who are delivering real schools partnerships who have been in the big chair now. And um, we've sat there, we've got this stuff done and you can see 17 different squares, oh, 17, 19 different squares on this graphic alone that tell you specifically what we bring to your school when you decide let's get into partnership around school culture and those three little things that we've spoken around today around student behaviour, around workload and around communicating effectively with parents are just a small part of it. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that really goes towards not only your strategic ambitions that you have for your school, but also for, you know, the I guess the moral the the the, uh, the moral intentions that you have and the the the, um, the deep emotional ambitions that you have for your school as well. So all I want to do is I want to encourage you. There's a a, um, a flyer in there that just says Real Schools Flyer, and then there's one that says RS Three Step Partnership. They're two docs that'll help you to be able to understand a little further about what that's all about. But if you are new to the new to the Real Schools caper and you'd like to have a chat with us about that, don't worry, we don't, we're don't. we not going to send you an invoice for a chat, it's just a chat to see if we're a good fit. If you think that, you know, we've got, we have many schools at the moment that are contemplating kicking off partnerships in 2017 and if you think your school might be one of those, just pop the word chat in the question box and all we're going to do is reach out and find a way for us to, if you're local, have a coffee. Um, and if not, then um, then we'll might have a quick phone or a Skype chat uh, just to see whether there's something that we can do together that would make a that would make a difference for you. And um, the last thing I want to do is uh, just let you know about the next webinar. So the next one we're going to look at is student motivation. I, I'm finding a lot of people talk to me about you know disinterested students, um, students that are hard to you know hard to get them to work towards their goal. Going. So in the email that you get following up from today, in the next day or two, uh, you'll be getting uh, a link to be able to, um, to, you'll be getting a link to be able to register for this webinar. And what we want to do, I guess the goal about around, so we're not going to lament poor student motivation, we're not going to sit here and say that millennials and young people today are really just impossible to motivate, um, they, they just, they're just motivated differently. And so the way we're going to look at that is how can we can take young people who perhaps would rather be on their Xbox and how we can turn them into excited learners and outstanding achievers. Um, so very much about the strategies you can bring to your classroom that, um, that get kids on task 
and that get them happy to be on task around learning and not pining to be somewhere else. So we think that's an important topic and um, one that we're going to gear next month very much at your teachers. So um, feel free to, to uh, spread that link around and get your teachers involved. And um, obviously there's space for leaders there too, but, um, but very much something that we think will help people who are every day in the classroom. Hey, have a look around the, the Royal Schools website as well. Very happy for you to go and have a gawk and see how we might be of service to you there. And see, hopefully, there's a few resources in there that you might say that you might find interesting and pertinent as you move forward too. And as I promised before, for Leslie, um, here's the the email address that you can use if you flick an email address, uh, an email across to info at realschools.com.au, um, and just let us know what you're looking for. Um, so if it is just a, a conversation about something, or if it is some of those classroom management. Um, um, templates and some resources around how to get that going, um, feel free to grab that email address and drop us a line. So my last check, all right, attendees, just having a look to see do we have any hands up in the room? Uh, no, looking for questions. Leslie's asking if I as an individual teacher wanted to implement some of these strategies, would this work? I believe so, Leslie, I mean, particularly around student behaviour. If you go back to some of that stuff around consistency of language, if you go back to some of that consistency around the IBPs and asking for some support in getting those going, uh, what we know around that 3 to 5%, Leslie, is that um, they can cause up to 80% of the energy, time and stress of individual teachers. So what we want to do is say, okay, let's do something about narrowing the gap between 3% of students and 80% of the impact. Um, and so their strategies, I think if you go through those 15 strategies and get just a few of them going, uh, embed them as part of practice, come back and get a couple more going, I think you're in for a big year. So yes, I think there are strategies that you can get going straight away. So look, thank you so much everyone, been fabulous having you here, I need to check my time, I haven't gone overboard, terrific stuff. Uh, and look, to all of you, really, you know, the very best for a really fantastic year. I'm really looking forward to being a, a part of that journey with all of you. Stay in touch and we'll, um, we'll talk to you all really soon. See you in February.